said to these ladies, just think that we're sitting around a coffee table with wine glasses in our hands. Uh, we're going to have just a really casual discussion about uh, the topics that Henry has given us and this wonderful uh, discussion of gender and in the development and dramaturgy of new work. So uh, I'm going to ask them to, to uh, introduce themselves and tell you a little about themselves. I'm Nan Barnett. I am the executive director of National New Play Network, which is an alliance of about 50 theaters from all across the country who have a dedication to the development, production, and continued life of new plays. I'm based in Woolly, at the office at Woolly Mammoth in DC. Um, the theaters are all over the country of all different shapes and sizes. And uh, I am trained, I'm a kid actor trained North Carolina School of the Arts and transitioned from acting into management and um, helped start and grow and create a, a Lord Theater, which became the largest theater in the U.S., producing exclusively new and developing works. And uh, in this last year, I have transitioned over to be the executive director of NNPN. So I want to thank you for coming out and being here. And let's let you guys say, are you want to start? Great, yes. Uh, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I studied directing at Columbia University. Um, so I am a director, a teacher, a writer, and a feminist. Um, I believe that I was invited here today because I have a lot of strong opinions about Aristotle uh, and a lot of strong opinions in general about how to make political theater, um, how to include more women in the process, um, and ultimately, I hope, how to reach parity in the theater. Great. Good. Uh, I'm Jenny Webb. I'm a resident, one of the resident playwright here at Rogue Machine. And I uh, run the new play program up at the, the Will Gears Theatrical Botanicum up in Topanga Canyon. It's a classical rep theater. For the past 12 years, we've been uh, developing and supporting new plays. And I'm, as a playwright, I have a, a very specific voice, a very specific, very female voice, um, which is what drew me specifically to the subject of this panel. And in addition, in about, um, We'll talk a little more about this, but after the Sands study, it sort of the gender parity discussion in theater really kicked up in 2009 after this, this Sands study, uh, which we'll talk more about. Uh, playwright Laura Shamas, who is a LA and New York East Coast playwright, approached me and said, well, stuff is going on in New York. They've got to do stuff. What are we going to do about it here? So we formed um, the LA Female Playwrights Initiative. So it's called the uh, LAFPI. So if you've seen this around at the FBI, that's what that is. Uh, it's, it's, an it's a non-producing organization um, sort of to support female playwrights and the theaters that love them and support them, uh, to connect women artists to each other, and to sort of form as a springboard for projects that women come to us and, you know, we sort of hopefully will help make them happen. It's been since 2009, so we're hanging in there and doing it. Uh, I'm Ellen Gavin. I I came to theater from more from the women's movement side of things. I was involved in as a student activist and as a feminist. And uh, I wrote my first play about being one of the first women firefighters in the United States way back. And I was doing development in the Bay Area for a lot of theater companies. I was writing grants, and virtually every one of those theater companies was had a male artistic artistic director. If it was doing African American or Asian American or Latino, and I wrote for all of them or gay, or lesbian. It was very, very male-centric, so I formed a group in 86 to address that issue and to start producing plays by women, started as volunteers, grew the organization over 23 years that I ran it, it's still there, um, into a mid-sized theater. Uh, we bought an old vaudeville theater and renovated it in the mid-90s, reopened it in 2000, and did world premieres and West Coast premieres by writers like Shri Moraga, Irene Fornes, uh, Susan Laurie Parks, Sherilyn Lee, and our, our mandate, our mandate, if you will, was to present works by, new works by women, with half of those women being women of color. So, coming from that perspective, it's interesting when you don't, I, you know, our, our mission was such that we, I didn't have a choice. I, our mission was to present works by women, and of course, there were many to present and produce in advance. Um, at one point, we did start doing some work by male playwrights. We did Culture Clash. We did work by Ricardo Bracho, who was the first to write about 
gay men of color's experience. Um, so it's, it'll be interesting to talk about how the public perceives it, how the critics perceive it, how the audiences perceive it, and, and where the biases are, which I think there still exist, those biases. And I'm now writing for uh, screen and television, and um, it's been interesting there because the dynamics are as bad, if not worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been away for a bit from theater, maybe four years. But going back and looking at the statistics and studying up for this panel, not much has changed. So I'm really interested in having this conversation about is it structural, is it intrinsic, where are these biases coming from uh, to the extent that we still have the same number, about 17% of the work being done on American stages being written by women. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, I've just come from the National Showcase of New Plays that um, an NPM produces every year. And I was telling people that I was coming up here and doing this, and I was, we were talking about you know what's happening in your theater and in your community, and there's so many people who've become really actively involved, and not in the the oh I've been trying to do more women playwright, but really you know doing studies, gathering the information, and um, all the theories that are out there. And I just wanted to share one that uh, I was particularly struck by mm -hmm. yesterday, um, and that someone said to me that. I don't think how to phrase this. <laughs> um, they they had a theory that um, the difference between how men and women create plays is tied to the differences in how men and women derive pleasure from the sexual act. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> okay, that's a much better reason than I just don't want to produce a play by <laughs> So I wanted to, to start off and talk a little bit about some of the theories and the studies that are out there. You know, um, we just did, and NPN just did, a blind read of plays that were submitted by our member theaters. We had 51 plays submitted, and only 20% of them were by women. Now, when we read them blind, and we took them from the 51 down to the 20 finalists, that percentage held, so there was still 20% in the finals. Uh, and, and when I say they are, you know, they're totally blind. So I know that we, the SAN study, maybe you want to start by talking a little bit about that and what the, the thing that got everybody set up in arms about. Well, one of the, I mean, it was a very, it was a, she was, it was her thesis at Princeton, uh -huh. um, Emily Glassberg Sands, I think that's right. I know, I have names written down, because I don't remember them. Um, there were a lot of components to the study, but basically, in, in addition with the work that Julia Jordan had done in sort of uh, taking stock of New York theaters, that's where the 17%, you know, came, mm -hmm. came from. And a part of the study that was very controversial was sort of the, uh, uh, set up portion where female artistic directors um, saw, you know, read plays that were not blind and, you know, sometimes they switched the gender mm -hmm. of, you know, of who actually had written them. And female artistic directors said, you know, we're not going to take a chance on this, this play of plays by women. So, of course, that was the big hoopla and the media, yeah, everybody, you know, sort of spun that to say, oh, women hate women. That's what this is about. That's you know that's what this is about. But in reality, which is what I think um, a lot of the, the problem comes from, is the women artistic director said, "Hey, we don't want to take a chance financially on these unknown women whose names aren't known, to because we have theaters to run, and that is not going to fill houses, and that's not going to be a smart economic choice." But it, uh, where did that even come from? Well, the way it, technically the way it worked was they gave a male certain a male name and a female name to the same play, and they presented it to artistic directors, male and female, across the country. The male and literary managers, the male artistic directors and literary managers, did not discriminate. They gave basically equal evaluations, and it was a, it was a point system. Right. The female artistic directors and literary man managers ranked the women, I think it was 18% lower. <laughs> wow. 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 But part of what the discussion was that maybe female artistic directors and literary managers have 
have, a, you know, like a greater understanding of, and, and this is the second part of the study, which I found really fascinating, what they call, I think, the Jackie Robinson effect, which was that if you're going to be a female playwright and make it, for example, on Broadway, which is one in eight, um, you have to have, you have to be exponentially better than the men. And that maybe that factor of kind of the oppressed, you know, those of us who, you know, people who are oppressed kind of get being tougher on their own in the sense of, you know, you're going to have to, to uh, really excel. So in, in the, that part of the study, the one in eight playwrights on Broadway had 18% higher box offices. Huh. Yeah, so the, the, the concept that you so. can't sell a play by a woman right. is, but I, 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 I just am astounded that that even comes into play. Yeah, I, and we, I don't think we have any data on, on that. I think it's an assumption. That, that people is, feel that way? I was saying, I don't, I don't know, I don't think I've ever run into an artistic director who says, wow, that place by a woman, I can't do it. Well, I think what all this speaks to is how subliminal and subconscious most yeah, of this is. It is. I mean, it, from the lack of women submitting to your thing, from the way the women judge the other women, I mean, that says to me that we've internalized the backlash. We've internalized the sense that we're not as good, that we're not as capable, that we won't sell. And a big part of achieving parity is going to be letting go of that, having right. confidence. Well, that was one of the other things that somebody said to me this weekend was that they had a theory that women don't put their plays out there. Yeah. That a man writes a play, and I think this is what gets linked to the sexual act. Uh, a, man, <laughs> a man writes a play and he just goes, there, take my play. And a woman writes a play and she wants to take more care before it goes out. So I'm interested to see whether um, National League Play Network, along with Doris Duke and uh, the Mellon Foundation, are creating um, something that's going to be called the New Play Exchange. It's a huge database with social media aspects. You'll be hearing a lot more about it. We're about to begin beta testing on it, and it will roll out to the field in January of uh, 2011, uh, 2015. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be able to do is collect data about what plays are being uploaded by who and and when they're being written, as well as what's being produced. <coughs> so my, the thing that I put forth in this with the, those new figures from the uh, uh, theater educators, where we see that 68% of playwriting degrees in this country are still going to men instead of women. So I, my question was, are we, because it is so ingrained, are girls not even considering playwriting? Is that number changing? Um, as we see more and more women in MFA programs, are they not getting the skills that they need because they're not training? So 68%, is that a piece of it? Um, you guys see submissions. You know, the thing that you said about the, uh, your submissions, 20%, only 20% were female. And in the second part of that study, out of the sand study, uh, it was fascinating. It was, um, it was she she went to I think it's called Dooley I think it's yeah, a, Dooley. The, it's the basically a, a, a script aggregator uh, database, and there were, were exactly that percentage of men putting their plays up. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that men are have more kind of boldness about what they write; they're writing more prolific, uh -huh. prolifically, and they're putting it up. Um, you know, I think there's real questions about this. You know, if we want to get very kind of essentialist or determinist about it, you know, the, the studies just literally in the last two weeks, they have another study about male female brains, you know, and mm -hmm. the north south poles of men, the, the connectors between the, the, the back and the front of their brains are more dense than women, which are lateral. And, and if you want to be determinist about it, the women have more relational um, in, in uh, holistic thinking patterns and men do, but the men's pattern is to do a task well, repeatedly. <laughs> so, you know, and they're different, it's, if you want to be determined about it, but on the other hand, as, you know, wordsmiths, girls uh, speak earlier than boys do, they use more complex structures, they use, have bigger vocabulary. Women speak, women say 13,000 more words in a day than men do. <laughs> and we're talking about writing plays, but not about literature. Okay, so if we want to have that, it's, this is a really, it's a, a slippery slope, I think. Uh -huh. Because if you want to get into it, you know, the storytelling, the oral tradition, the communication, if we're, going to, if we're going to be deterministic about it, it's going to fall to women to say that we have great capacity, I would think. 
Okay, so then, then you look at something structural and you have to say these other factors. And I would maintain that in running the theater uh, that I ran that um, there's a synergy and there's, a, there's an interrelationship between, first of all, the plays themselves, the critics. For example, in the Bay Area, we had two critics, white men, that controlled the reviews in the San Francisco Chronicle for 30 years. <laughs> Okay, and no, there's no, a no. little clapping so white right man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's because there was a, there's a system in the Bay Area, and there's an empty chair. There's a little white man, bald man, sitting there looking. There's a little bald man clapping, and there's a little bald man standing in his chair. And I remember one year at Brava, um, we developed, we had a cartoonist draw us an empty chair an African-American woman that was starting to spout dreadlocks <laughs> and grow breasts. The third one, she was bigger, her hair was longer, she was screaming, and the last one, she was yelling. We would look and say, Here's, this is our review. <laughs> um, and I saw systematically, and it was so difficult to not make decisions based on this. As an example, uh, the first play we did, Shereen Moraga, Shadow of a Man, was directed by Maria Irene Fornes. It was spectacular. It was so beautiful. And Irene did the set, and it was at the Eureka Theater, and it was actually the same, I think it was in the same month that Angels in America was at the Eureka Theater, the first production ever of Angels in America. So I have these two things in my memory in 89, our production mm -hmm. with Irene and Angels in America. Not well reviewed. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. You're kidding me, it's a classic. The next time that we produced a play by Cherie, and it lined up, um, I didn't select him for this reason, but, Heroes and Saints by Albert Takasakis, who was a fabulous director, who was very well respected in the Bay Area. And I consciously thought, you know what? If Albert directs Cherie's play, I bet it gets well reviewed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it put her on the map. It was just incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, was that, I mean, how do I, how do I interpret how, that? Yeah, how do you, how do you how do I interpret that? that? Right. That's, you know, we presented so many cutting edge works. Like Susan Laurie Parks, I knew, okay, Susan Laurie Parks is going to be too edgy. Let me hit him with all the New York reviews in a packet, and he'll know, oh, you know, <laughs> New York liked her. I better investigate a little more. <laughs> so it was a conscious thing about, because I would see smaller companies, edgy companies that had very male driven work that I thought was imperfect, that it wasn't my taste, get rave reviews, and yet so many women, and I did international work. <laughs> If I didn't have, if I was having the second production and I could give them some educational material about it, maybe, but you know, the constant battle. So there's that issue. There's also the issue of just female characters on a stage and how they're written and the perception of, you know, the stereotypes, you know. But anyway, it's just that there's a lot in it and I feel like it's yeah. a synergy that has to be discussed. You know, it's, it's, it's women in the context of a sexist, misogynist society. And there yeah. definitely are those kinds of structural things that keep women from getting involved, whether it starts in education or um, in their early professional days. And obviously, all of those barriers are even harder to get over for women of color. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned the male director. One of the theories that I've heard is that theaters don't want to trust female directors with big budgets. <laughs> that it has to do with who's, who they trust with money. Um, which I think is, uh, yeah, uh, I, I kind of buy that. You know, in terms of the submitting thing, though, I think we have to look at all the other fields and know that there's data out there that says that women also submit fewer op-eds. They submit fewer articles to publications. They don't ask for raises. Um, they don't negotiate for a higher salary when they're getting hired. So it's not just about the plays themselves. It's about how we, how we put ourselves out there. Now, I think a play that was written by a woman according to uh, how we have sex, I guess, would have a lot of exposition and three climaxes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, sounds like a good play to me. I totally agree. I just quickly about that. Josefina Lopez, there's a quote that I read on HowlRound, which was, uh, it came out of the convocation that happened in Boston um, of the Latino, uh, the Latino yeah. artist. And Josefina, I guess, made quite a stir when she wrote, in, at, in Boston when she said this, I want to see a world filled with the vision of theater as multi-orgasmic, spiraling and flowing female energy. I dream of a future where art making practice is no longer conceptualized after that model of male orgasm. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's out there everywhere we look. I would, I, when I go to one of Henry's questions, um, 
because I think this is a, a, a really basic starter for us. In your experience, are there real differences in the techniques women and men use to tell stories? And can you describe and illustrate some of those techniques? In my experience, there's a difference in the way feminists tell stories. And so feminists could be either men, men or, or women, women, right? So there's a difference in the way people tell stories who have an awareness and a consciousness of what they're doing with gender and sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, as a director, like to work with anybody who's ever studied with Paula Vogel. Right. Um, there's something about that program, uh, wherever she's teaching, uh, the, the people come out of that able to write dialectic. Right, so to right. use the Brechtian term, they're putting out multiple points of view at a time. Mm -hmm. The Aristotelian term, uh, 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 um, the Aristotelian uh, structure, which I guess you could say is a little bit more patriarchal, maybe a little bit more male, is really one point of view. And that point of view, if there are any questions about it, it gets resolved by the end. Mm -hmm. um, so people who have this consciousness about gender and race and class and all of those other things as well tend to be able to write with a lot of different points of view and then not necessarily resolve them all. You know, leave the audience to wonder about some of these things when they get home. So that brings me to another question about women mentors. You know, are we, will it change by virtue of there being more women uh, like Paula, like Marsha, you know, teaching in major universities, uh, putting, mm -hmm. like, I guess I'm here today because I'm going to talk for education, I don't know why. But, um, you know, are we seeing a change? I know when I first started as a managing director in the law system, we had so few women managers that we would have ladies of Lord spa days because there were only seven or eight of us who would go and do that, right? So now, so now in, when you go to a Lord meeting, it's like 60% women. My dad was a small town veterinarian and didn't want me to go to vet school because he thought it was too hard for a woman to be a vet. I don't know, that number is something like 80% now of women getting vet degrees. So I, there is, it, that is driving it. So as we see more students trained by Paula Vogel, um, you know, are we seeing, a, a, we talked about a sea change when we were talking about, a, will that happen? Is it just now getting there? Anecdotally, and I, we, I couldn't find the numbers on this, but um, I feel like there are more women in MFA playwriting programs right now than there are men just from talking to people and knowing people that are in those programs and teaching in those programs that are saying that they're, they're, what they're seeing is many, many more women coming into the field. So maybe if we had this discussion 15 years from now, would it be different? You know, I think that the point you were making about, I just wanted to just follow up on that for a second, about the structural uh, teachers and the mentors. I think of someone like an, uh, Maria Arie Fornas, right. who is, uh, you know, such a, a mentor to Latino playwrights across the country mm -hmm. for 30 years, a uh, very different structural approach to mm -hmm. writing. Um, Susan Laurie Parks, you know, with repetitive gestures and repetitive texts and com coming at things from the back end. And I mean, Octavio um, Solis has a beautiful piece also on the TCG website or how around about his, how he was influenced by Susan Laurie Parks. I mean, mm -hmm. just there's a catharsis, there's a kind of Aristotelian catharsis, but it's not happening in a straight line. Right. It's layering and it's circling back, and and I think there's a lot of male playwrights that are maybe plugging into a more feminine side of themselves. Uh, Tony Kushner or Mac Wellman or Eric Eng, who are doing these wordplay language switch-ups. You know, it's not the straight path. You know, a flawed character hit by circumstance, overcoming it to a, a positive outcome. It's like that's not what we have to have in American theater. And I think, you know, leaving ambiguity. Um, uh, I, I guess the, I keep thinking of that circling back. I think it's just a very interesting approach to dramaturgy. Uncover, uncover, uncover. You know, and that, and that, you know, is is that a female impulse? I don't know. I just think that uh, that you know, being trained as audience members, artistic directors, um, critics, to have the same kind of explosive conclusion that wraps it all up right. is not necessarily. And that single point of view thing, which I think mm -hmm. is really great to, to think about at, when, we, when we are looking at the structure of a play and, what, and how a playwright chooses to put 
whatever it is they want to put out there. Yeah. A single point of view versus the multiple point of view. That's really fascinating. And I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, regarding the mentoring thing, um, you know, I've heard a lot of stories about, uh, say, 30 years ago in the theater, women who were artistic directors, um, who shall not be named, <laughs> who by choice never hired a, a woman to direct at her theater. And I think there was a sense that, you know, nobody helped me. I got here on my own. Why should I help you? Uh, and I do think that that's changing. I mean, when I look at um, even students just one generation younger than I am, they have these groups of women that are very tight. Uh -huh. You know, they really support each other. They have no fear about that. And I think that really is going to change. And I think that's changing in terms of mentorship and in terms of support and communication, you know, in other areas. Um, the, the movement, the gender parity movement that's happening now in LA, San Francisco, so hot, and um, and in New York and DC, <coughs> people are really communicating each other with each other and exchanging right. resources and e exchanging and looking at each other's plays and saying, oh, this is different. Oh, maybe it's okay that my my, my voice is different. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I I think that's really exciting. And I think part of that also has to be, ha there as playwrights or as artists, we want to like associate with with good artists that we respect and, and we like and, and can challenge us. But I think we also have to open ourselves up with beginning artists who may surprise us too. You know, when, when we formed LFPI, we specifically wanted it to be anybody, you know, come on, you know, come on, come on sisters, you know, be a part of it because there are a lot of wonderful groups. You know, I'm a part of wonderful groups. And people say, oh, how do we become a part of that? And it's, well, you know, which is something, but I, but I think that just really sort of opening ourselves up to mentors, to be mentors, is really, really, really important. Um, it was interesting, one of the, what is his name? KC something or other at primary stages, I wrote down numbers Child. so that I would- Child. 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 Yeah, Child. Child. At, um, at primary stages. It was interesting because right after the, the sand study came out and there was all this sort of poop line energy, primary stages did a season of all women playwrights. And, a lot of so I was talking to him a little bit about that you know how, how it was how it was approached that one of the things that he said about he mentioned uh, plays he says well I think male plays have different rhythms you know I mean first of course anybody would say oh no there's no difference between female and male plays and then talking a little bit he says I think there are different there are different rhythms in male and female plays and I think audiences are starting to get used to that but I think they will have a long way to go to get used to that. And then another thing that he, that he said, he was talking to, about Constance Condon, who had a, he was on some, who had a, a story about playwriting class that, that, you know, an exercise she gave to students was write a scene about um, when you sort of broke away from your parents. This is paraphrasing through, through uh, you know, through all these people, but basically the men wrote scenes about breaking chairs and screaming and throwing things, and the women wrote things about closing books and giving looks and <laughs> walking away slowly. And, you know, so is the question, do we need to, he says, you know, Constance was saying, you need to amplify that. Is that part of it, or do we also, I mean, I find closing a book and giving a look more interesting than throwing a chair myself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes. So is part of that changing audiences and changing what we expect when we come to the theater, which is, you know, back to how were the plays different? You know? What's dramatic? Yeah, what's dramatic? What's dramatic? And, yeah. you know, it's funny that the professors at UCLA and the colleagues, some of the women will say violence and sex, that's it. Anything else is just not. <laughs> and then you have to take that and say, but you know what? Women, first of all, men perpetuate more than 90% of the violence in the world, and women are the victims of it a lot. So you see a play like Pulitzer Prize winner, like, ruined, you know, Lynn Nottage, and you say, okay, that's, that's, the, that's not, that's a transition from victimhood to, you know, protagonist in your own life. And, and, and so women's relationship to violence is, is very different. And so if that's the paradigm, which is that this kind of violent confrontation of a character, flawed character with an outside force or, you know, the kind of tropes, you know, right. <laughs> then, then um, we've got to invent a new language. I mean, the thing that I, I've been feeling this week, I guess it's Nelson Mandela passing, and mm -hmm. I hate, I don't want to make what we're talking about, you know, have more significance than, you know, or equal his significance, but power concedes nothing without a demand. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's incredible that we can keep talking about women's place in theater. It's like, no, you know what? It's Just time to do it. start counting the numbers of women on stages and saying it's just not acceptable. Um, I was reading the TCG uh, blog page, which um, is quite wonderful. I, I have to I'll mention the writer later who's coordinating it. But there's a lot of talk on that page about, um, you know, kind of taking our rightful place. It just seems like, you know, I, I, I got the um, Santa Theatre Group program, for example, and I'm just going to say it here, 18 productions, mm -hmm. one female playwright, one director. One woman director, three people of color, all in the same repertory theater, <laughs> and, and, you know, at the Douglas. So to me, that's like that's the male tape reform. <laughs> it's just not acceptable. It's just not acceptable because it's not acceptable to have, you know, storytelling, our culture, our our democratic right to express, you know, our lives, uh, you know, not be fair. You know, and not be equal. And there's a, a young blogger, another, I'll tell you her name too, and I look it up, but she was talking about how her generation, which is kind of the Obama generation of ascendancy, which is multicultural and feminist and aware of difference and supportive of, you know, disability and, and identity and gender and all of that, is like, this is the new world. And she was her, I think the headline of her blog was something like, is American theater stuck the way the GOP is? <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, the GOP, yes. Like, <laughs> saying the same platitudes and not doing a damn thing about representation. It's just not acceptable anymore. But see, so I question whether what we want is to be on the taper stage. Um, I mean, when we think about who their audience is, the, I don't know that that's who I want to necessarily speak to. I mean, maybe the answer is to just let those theaters die. Well, they have the power, they have own. the money. Sure, no idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to be paid. I absolutely want to be paid. As someone who I just built the theater from scratch, yeah. it took 30 years. I don't know if we have to wait for that. And that doesn't yeah. seem right, you know. First of all, they're receiving, I mean, they're receiving, in many cases, tax dollars. Huge support. Mm -hmm. And huge support from the community. You know, they're in our spaces. A lot of them are in, you know, many of them have breaks from the cities and the cities that they're in that are unbelievable. So, I mean, it's about resources to me. It's like. And you're making the assumption, Holly, that they're, by saying their audience, you're saying their audience is old and white. That would be my guess. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that's so, so that's a perfect segue for this I question. I against old white people. No, no, no. I get it. I, I read a theater in Florida. I can tell you a lot about that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that women audience members believe that they would rather see a play written by a man? Hmm. Wow. I believe that women audience members would rather see a play with women in it. Hmm. I think they're probably looking for characters who speak to them. And women who are, you sort of alluded to this, women who the characters are subjects, they act. Yes. Mm -hmm. They are not just acted upon. Right. And I think whether that play is written by a man or a woman, I mean, I don't know. How many of you really look at the, at the playbill and go, oh, this is by a man, I don't like it as much. Or this is by a woman, I don't like it as much. I think it's about what we're seeing on stage right. and how we're responding to that. Okay. Now, women are more likely to write women characters who are active, who are subjects. So they go together a little bit. But I think it's about what we're seeing on stage more than about who wrote it. Yet, women buy the tickets in America, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so yeah. Same for film. Right. I don't know if people know the Bechtel rule. Do people know this? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Who has her play, uh, her wonderful play, uh, Fun Home, which is getting great reviews in New York, um, written by Lisa Cron. Beautiful, beautiful book, based on a graphic novel. 85, she came up with a rule. I thought it was so fantastic, and I've used it to this day. The Bechtel rule, which is that you look at a film, and you say it was done for film, is there more than one woman in it, and do they have names? Do they speak to each other about something other than men? <laughs> and it's a pretty simple rule. Is there more than one woman, and they have names, and they speak to each other about something other than men? And if you go through the list of films, I mean, of course, all the big Terminators and all that, they fail. Right. But then, you know, films like Simple Children's uh, Toy Story fails, Up fails, like many, many movies fail, Princess Bride fails. Uh, Dead Poet Society fails, two women simply talking about something other than the male protagonist in the movie. I think it's a really good indication, and it's about agency, about how we, and it's internalized, of course, how we don't, you know, 
is see ourselves as agents of, you know, of agency. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so it's, it's 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 fascinating, and I think that we've got it inside of us. I write sometimes. I write and I go, why am I conceiving of this character as a man? Mm -hmm. I could be conceiving of this character as a woman, but somehow when I think of the powerful person that I want to write, it comes up as male, and I think that's really sad. Rita Bear is mentioning that gravity also fails the Bechdel test, and I would argue that that's still a very feminist film. Yeah. So it, it, it has a limited, you know, it tells us exactly what, what it tells us. Well, didn't not you write about this? That. Yeah. What was the other movie yeah. that you came up uh, The Mako Mori test, which yes. is based on the movie yeah. Pacific Rim. So the Bechdel test really is, am I going to spend my money on this or not? Yeah. It's but a way I of do, deciding, yeah. am I going to buy a ticket and support this, it's a tool. Uh, this yeah. movie? So the, uh, when Pacific Rim came out, came out, there's one female character in it named Mako Mori, um, and she's an Asian American woman, or maybe actually just Asian woman, uh, and she has a great story arc. She's a subject. She has things she wants. She's trying to get them from other people. She's different at the end of the movie than she is at the beginning. So there were a bunch of feminists who wanted to support this movie. So they created this new test, the Mako Mori movie is, uh, test. Is there, is there at least one woman in the movie who has her own story arc? And that's another way of, of, of looking at it. Because conceivably in the Bechdel test, they really, it might be these two women and they have one scene and they're talking about what to have for lunch. And you know what I mean? Right, so they um, that, that can pass the test. Yes, yeah, exactly. So the Mako Mori test gets a little bit more at that subject-object difference. Is she just being acted upon, or is she really pursuing something on her own? I like both. <laughs> and you probably will have a very limited viewing opportunity <laughs> in the next year. I mean, that, save a lot of but, money. But again, yes. yeah, because, 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 as you were saying, <clears throat> they're being financed, created, directed, driven by an industry that believes that that's what they need to do. And yeah. yet, you know, like uh, I've just been reading, uh, uh, do people know it's, it's Lois Weber or Weber? She was the first woman director, and she started with D.W. Griffith. She had her own studio. She was a screenwriter, a director, a producer. She had her own studio. She developed the moving camera shot. She came up with the first lighting. I mean, this woman was incredible. She was the first one to have a cutaway to get the perspective of the woman in the film, as opposed to just <laughs> one perspective. Wow. Genius, genius. And she literally had her studio wrenched away from her <laughs> by her husband, and it was around power and money. Mm -hmm. And you look at this and you say, genius. She directed, I think it was 400 films. Mm -hmm. Four, she would direct 27 films in a year. She did very socially conscious work about the early birth control issues and, and poverty and you know she's kind of anti-capitalist. Anyway, this woman is someone to look to and, and so I, I and when you see that how the very beginning of an industry had these powerful women and the pushing out, it is it's not a it's it's not a uh, passive thing, <laughs> you know. Right. To to say this is gonna be mine. And if you have American theater where, where white men basically are saying to people of color and to women, this is mine, uh, I, I just think it has to be broken up. And I, I do think, again, I don't have the writers, I haven't written here, but the, the blog that uh, TCG has, um, there are people there saying, you know what, count. And maybe, maybe the fact of the matter is, if you don't have a diverse season, you have a failed season. And I know that, like, I know Lauren Gunderson has been involved in the San Francisco counting and Woody and Sullivan's doing it in D.C. And I assume that somebody here in L.A. is, is doing that as well and pointing it out. So the, the idea that we're hearing a lot uh, at NNPN is this, I'm going to commit to a 50-50 season uh, with writers or, and or directors, I think specifically. Um, you start to look at the number of actors that you're employing and the gender, you know, that you make it just count. You have you just say, this is how we're going to do it. If we have more of those start to happen and we have more productions, does that in itself breed more productions? Yes. <laughs> it does. I mean, does that make more women think, I can write, I can be produced, I can be a director? So just by bumping the numbers, we can bump the attitude? It, it's interesting in terms of the 50-50 the commitment. 
there's been a lot of discussion of Cindy Cooper in New York and then August Shulman, the TCG 2.0, which is an online uh, thing with Carrie Bentley, something or other. Um, they're working on a, a pledge to sort of a gender parity toolkit somebody else is working on to give to theaters and a pledge for theaters to make, you know, like the writer, you know, this theater is blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of discussion. Or, oh, no, no, we can't, we can't make them commit to 50-50. Nobody will do that. But can, can, we say, can we say one play per season by a woman, and, and is, the, is, that, is that fair? No, nobody's going to do that. Somebody says, and then, you know, and you, then somebody came up with me, Cindy Cooper and um, a, a colleague came up with, the, this organization is committed to advancing and sustaining fairness, equality, and gender parity for all theater artists. What? You I know. Mean, so, so uh, anybody can say yes to that, right? Right. Yeah. So, so it is hard. It's like, how do you, you know, what is a, accountability? That's I mean, the question. Is that part right. of us as women that we go, oh, no, 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 we don't want to ask for 50. No. We don't want to ask for 50%, but just give us one. Is, is that okay? No, that's not okay. But then the reality of the situation <laughs> is, I mean, our artistic directors, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, tricky territory. How do you, how do you get into that? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not an artistic director. I don't have a theater. I certainly can't do it. <laughs> you know? I, if, I I, if you wouldn't mind, Jill Dolan wrote something, and I think it might have been as a donor at, at New Horizons. I just found it on the internet the other day. And I thought it was just like a nice, simple way to say it without hammering people over the head and saying, you must do this. If all theaters believe that social diversity is an artistic necessity, a multitude of stories and happily competing perspectives would radiate into our national imagination. We would hear ever new stories about people, people who aren't often represented on the stage. We would delight in new perspectives and experiences seen through innovative narrative and visual techniques. We'd come to the theater not to just affirm what we know, but to expand our repertoire of knowledge about American society. We could practice different ways to engage in a more human, extensive community. I think that, that's kind of the feeling that I feel like. It's just like it's not a punishment, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's, it's right. Like, you know, it's a, it's a flourishing. It's a, and I guess I, the young writer that wrote about the kind of Obama, the, the ascendant community of Americans, who America is, which is racially, culturally <laughs> diverse, um, it's just much richer and more interesting to me. Well, there's the great Marsha Noman quote of, you know, a theater that's missing the stories by women is missing half the stories. Half the stories, right. I, when I first went to South Florida in the 80s as a, as a young actor of female persuasion, <laughs> I... Uh, Did it be persuaded? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some days. Um, no, I, I can remember very specifically being on stage one time, and the reason I'm no longer an actress is because I terrible at staying focused on what I was doing. I was much more interested in looking at who was out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sure I was having some very artistic moment, but what I was really doing was going, wow, I better work a lot in the next five years because these people are all going to be dead. And there's, there's was no, the houses were so gray and you know, people would tell stories of, you know, my theater's audience is, you know, the youngest audience in South Florida. We have an average age of 72. <laughs> or, you know, my parents, my grand, their grandparents go to the next theater. Um, but what continued to happen in South Florida, and up until a few years ago when we had a lot of theater there, um, was that people filled in. There were still retirees that were coming, but they were, you know, there was a another crop coming in, so some of them would step to the other side of the curtain and you know, other people in their 60s and 70s would start coming to the theater on a regular basis. So if we are talking about the marketing piece of this, you know, do women buy the tickets, women of a certain age buy the tickets, yet I know how resistant people can be to having women of a certain age on stage, right? Mm -hmm. There, those stories are scary to people to talk about aging, to talk about what happens. How do we, how do we start changing that? Because I think there, women would be interested in this. I know women are interested in those stories. You might learn something about how to do it better, right? And why we go to theater to see another perspective. How do you, 
How do we prove that? How do you say, write a play and produce it on a regular basis so that we start to see those numbers go up? Is it just a, just do it? Is it instead of, you Well, know, you were saying earlier that, you know, there's no study, there's no studies study been funded, so we can't even say what's mm -hmm. going on really. And this notion that people have of being afraid that the audiences won't be there if there's more women on the stage, is that anecdotal or is that real? Does that really happen? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, what's yeah. the truth of that? That hasn't been proven. So, and this is kind of similar to what's happening in film. If you look at film, it's like the, the number one movie-going population in this country are Latinos that are making right. or breaking films, 25%. Women buying the tickets, returning. Hello, GOP. Making making um, some of the tentpole uh, films work. Um, so, like, and I would I would maintain that if we look closer, we might find those dynamics at work in American theater too, among mm -hmm. people of color and among women, because it is true that women buy the tickets to go to things. Right. So, you know, I think that we're living with kind of this burden of uh, uh, unproven fears, you know. But I mean. Think about how many shows and movies Judy Dench has done about aging women right. that have done really well. Right. Why has that not spawned more? That's what I sort of wonder. Once we even have a couple of successes, right. why is it harder to get more? I mean, we keep mentioning the film industry, and that's always a really interesting question for me. Do we have a trickle-down culture or a trickle-up culture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we influenced by film, and so we're... We being theater. Theater people, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Um, where, you know... The, if you're over 40 as a woman, you're really probably not going to get much work for the right. rest of your life. You know, so are we really influenced by that, or are we the people who are going to change things, and that that's going to then change the bigger theaters, the places with the bigger budgets, and eventually film? I don't know the answer to that. I hope that it's trickle up. I think we have a much better chance of changing these of things changing than it. Hollywood does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what you were saying earlier about um, you know whether we have to depend on the on the center theater groups of the world. There is a notion of scale here. I mean, if you're putting three hundred million dollars into a tentpole <laughs> franchise, you could make, you know, what is it, ten, thirty million dollar movies for that. I mean and the idea that the smaller theaters seating the smaller theaters to create successful projects is a smart way to go. And the same mm -hmm. thing with independent film. Mm -hmm. Frankly the twenty, thirty million dollar movies that make two hundred million dollars and surprise everyone because they're they're human interest stories that people want to see. Right. If the if the studios would take that approach. They're not. <laughs> it would be nice if they would, but you know, I think it's a question too of, you know, kind of decentralization of mm -hmm. some of the resources. And are they not because of the money? Is that that's what Yeah. Right. So I mean, you could make an argument. Why don't you take a risk on thirty films, and you might have five of them or six of them that are spectacular and make you your one tentpole in revenue? But they're not—they don't think that way. Right? Right. Well, the one thing that the film industry is facing that we're not is international markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, when when the film industry says uh, movies about women won't sell, what they mean is movies about women won't sell in China. Yeah. And in fact, what they mean, because again, we have really no data about what will actually sell in China. Right. It's right. a brand new market. Right. What they really mean is they won't sell to the Chinese government, who has to say it's okay to show this here. Mm -hmm. So now, it will be really interesting to see. Gravity did incredibly well in China. Uh, the first Hunger Games movie did incredibly well in China. Mm -hmm. So are they going to abandon this assumption they have that these movies won't sell or not? But I think that's one challenge they have. That we that we do. I mean, a lot of us do make international theater, but uh, that's where most of the money at this point comes from for films. So, if we're saying that marketing does matter, and it does matter in theaters, why don't we know? Why why haven't we done the studies? What's you know there ought to be a way. Well, I mean, I think we have a lot of studies on subscriber-based theater. Right. But that's a really different creature than what we're talking about. We're talking about trying to get new people in, selling shows one show at a time, not a, not a whole season. I mean, I think a lot of these theaters with money and budgets and endowments and stuff, they're programming a whole season for the same audience. Mm -hmm. So we, I think people are studying their own audiences and not necessarily looking at the larger culture. Yeah, because you can only capture what you can capture, right? right? You don't, you know. You're not standing outside in the street going, why don't you go to theater? You're just asking <laughs> the questions of who is going right, to Right, of who, the people who are already in the seat, yeah. Right. But I mean, when we talk, when I mentioned the thing about the, G, the same problem as the GOP, I mean, 
what is the sustainability model there? If you're talking about having an elder, an elder white, <laughs> you know, uh, muddied audience in a country that's changing the way this country has changed in terms of percentage of people of color, right, being majority, um, it's not very forward thinking. Well, I think it's, you know, it's why we've lost so many theaters in Florida, is that we were so um, completely consumed by that subscriber uh, concept. And as people's lives change, and they're no longer willing to commit to the third Friday of every run, um, we didn't have a, a methodology for dealing with that. Uh, and so they, were, we, they went away. Well, Los Angeles theaters, I mean, with the, the question is, how do we get butts and seats? And it has been for as long as we've been all doing theater. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and as, for as long as we've been all doing theater, we realize, oh my god, there's no formula. Because just when you think you figured it out, something else will change. There'll be, you know, oh gee, there's no press in LA anymore. Right. Or, or you know. In the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so it's different. And in, in ter it, it's re one of the things that's frustrating that I've heard from a lot of people is it's very tricky to, you know, you think, okay, let's do an all-woman season. I mean, there's a, a couple people that, are, I mean, Playwrights Horizons has been very female-centric for the past two seasons. Um, Theater One in Boston is doing an all-female season. Um, this time Steppenwolf right now has four out of five, you know, five plays by women. So we'll see what happens because I hate to say it, but it's hard to get groups of women together to go to theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least in, in my experience and anybody else's experience. Because we're multitasking. I, because, I mean, you know, and you talk about, yeah, I mean, you talk about studies. It's like, well, yeah, we need to do a study of that. Well, we're all making art. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, we're and not getting paid for it for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, Corey, uh, Corey Perloff's doing a study right now about, uh, about gender and a gender and leadership study. And hopefully she's got some funding for that one and it'll come out. But there's been no funding for any of these studies. There's been studies in, in internationally, in, in, the, in, in the UK, Australia, Chicago did their own study, Boston did their own study, LA, we did a study here in LA, New York study, blah, blah, blah. And none of those have, none of those have had funding. The only one that's had funding is 2002, is the New York State Theater Susan Jones study. So, it's like, yeah, we need numbers. We don't really know what's going on, but there's no, it's all just us doing it because we care so much about it. But it gets, it gets exhausting to care, you know? Mm -hmm. So how can we keep that, keep energized and keep connecting with each other and, and keep it going for the long haul because this isn't some, oh, we're gonna like make a big fuss and it's gonna solve the problems in two weeks. I think we need some women PhDs to take this on. There you go. To do the <laughs> research within their institutions yeah. Yeah. and get it funded. What are the alternatives to, uh, uh, in quotes, the essence of drama is conflict? <laughs> <laughs> the essence of drama is conflict. Oh. I, I grew up in a family of women, really strong southern women. and. There's plenty of drama in conflict. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, the idea of this books and looks versus yeah, yeah, yeah. breaking chairs. Um, again, you know, I personally find it more intriguing as yeah. well. You know, anybody can break a chair, but mm -hmm. until you have been totally dressed down <laughs> without words by your mother yeah. for, you know, while you're standing at the kitchen sink, you don't know drama, in my opinion. So. <laughs> Is there a way of doing that? Is there a way of making it more viable, that lack of violence, the lack of the door you know, I, I think it is the essence of, of drama is conflict. I think that's true. And, and, and if you think about some of our greatest male playwrights, you know, thinking of August Wilson or Tennessee Williams, they were coming at it from an inside, to yeah. my mind, kind of relationship, feminine point of view, Very. along with, it, it's animus and anima, you know, right. it's both sides of the coin, and I think we all should strive for that, you know, I mean, I think that women shouldn't, we just shouldn't say, well, we're the relational people, you know, what's the, what's the force, the force, the driving force is conflict, well, but it's how it's expressed, and, 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 you know, whether there's, you know, I don't know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, who says there can't be a lot of conflict, and, you know, you're my mom, reading a book. <laughs> there can be. 
right? I mean, as long as there's a line between us, as long as there's that taut line, that's conflict. That's conflict, yeah. right. So, do we not need to blow up New York City? <laughs> you know, I mean, we, can we... Or kill the president? Oh, right. We, I mean, there, if you, if we agree that that can be very dramatic, and I think Tennessee Williams is a, an excellent example of um, that voice that mm -hmm. crosses the line. Well, I mean, I would not give this advice to playwrights because these are not the kinds of plays I want to direct, but if you want to write something that's going to sell, you write something that happens on one set, has no more than four actors. So, I mean, there's not, right, that's, that's if you want to be on a regional theater stage, that's what you need to write. There's not a lot of room for chair throwing in, in those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Venus and Fur, you know, got boots and a whole <laughs> set. Um, well, I think the interesting thing in this conversation about Aristotelian structure is, you know, the idea that, you know, in the male orgasm and that whole conversation was <laughs> whether whether a structure, a dramatic structure is building towards this explosive end or whether and and women writers get accused a lot of being episodic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's the other structure which actually Jill Jill Dolan also mentioned was, well that's more of the female orgasm. <laughs> the small the, the you know the, the series of explosions. So, you know, I think that we might need to open ourselves up to those ideas, you know, and to the thought that there isn't just a grand finale, conclusive, a here's the answer to this, and, and that ambiguity, and that, you know, conversation about what it meant afterwards, you know, rather than a, tying it up in a bow and handing it to the audience, that that's, to me, more interesting. And there are a lot of male and female play playwrights that are exploring that, but a critic will beat you over the head with that term, mm -hmm. episodic. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, yeah, your, that, if that, your that's script a negative. feels that, that's like it was kind of not, you know, honed in a very tightly, you know, wound way to explode <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Uh, huh. So I think that's important to open ourselves to different, different, you know, you mean to modalities. Be, right, non-episodic? No, no, that epi episodic is an option. Oh, okay, convince people that that, yeah. I mean, I, I remember Brecht, I don't remember Brecht, but uh, in, in office, when he was first starting out, I remember uh, he said, you know, we've got to train audiences to expect something different from the theater. Yeah. Um, and I, it makes me sort of sad that we haven't yet achieved yeah. that, because of course what he was talking about was episodic theater, where right. one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the next, where we skip around. Um, where we move in place and time. And what he described his plays were his desire for theater to be cumulative rather than conclusive. Mm -hmm. So we don't go to one big thing, we add up a whole bunch of things and by the end we have, um, maybe he was a little bit more feminine, we have a lot of different little climaxes. Although in defense of old white men <laughs> who um, you know, follow this model, if we think about the well-made play, um, another sort of simplification of the Aristotelian structure. Uh, I teach a doll's house or a dollhouse, and uh, if you ask students, you know, what, where, where is the climax? They actually have a lot of different answers. You know, is it actually when she walks out the door and slams it? Is it when she says, "I'm leaving"? Is it when he opens the letter? Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 not as cut and dry as even the most cut and dry playwrights would like it to be. I think one of the problems is that that is really hard to do. It is really hard to write good, realistic theater that logically follows from one thing to the next. It just exists in its own. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to find it a satisfying ending. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it, are we taught, even if it's ingrained, that the only way to end a play is to tie it all up in a bow mm -hmm. and say to the audience, okay, there, that's the end of the story. Um, is that what, because people get so frustrated sometimes, I think, with, well, what happens next, or how, did, why is it okay to do that, and can we continue to embrace the idea that you don't have to have a climax and a resolution? You know, one thing that's really interesting to me about this is uh, the way the human brain works, right? So when we're, um, when our brains are developing when we're kids, we learn a beginning, middle, end structure to everything. Mm -hmm. We see something we want, we go to it, we get it. Beginning, middle, end. So it's, it's hardwired into our brains 
to think that way. And what I've discovered when I've tried to deconstruct plays is even when you sort of take them apart, there's this human instinct to put them back together yeah. <laughs> in an order that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get around that. Um, so even though I like other structures better, I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to writers who continue to use the Aristotelian model. Um, what's fun for me as a director is to try, at least try to take them apart a little bit. So if I did a dollhouse, you know, I would decide which of those places I thought should be the climax, and maybe it would be a really odd place not where most people usually think it is, and I would use that to sort of point out Nora's agency or the choice she's making in that moment being revolutionary or something. But it's hard to do. I think it's powerful when women hit Mary Zimmerman or playing that speech or mm -hmm. people are deconstructing classics and finding the moment, you know, looking at the House of Bernard Alba again and going, whoa, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. right. and, re and, 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 you know, reshaping it. And isn't that what we're asking for? I guess that was when I read that from Joe Dolan, it's like, is it more interesting to have to, to, to have the, the structural question, the cultural issues, the the, the format, the, have it be so unexpected and different and diverse that in one season you might see five different approaches to play structure from different people? I mean, I, that's what I love when I see something that's culturally something that I've never experienced before. It's mm -hmm. thrilling. Absolutely thrilling to see something that you've never, you don't know the language, you don't know the place, you don't know the you know, the relationships, it's, it's, it's discovery. And I think that would be interesting if it, you know, I don't think it should be said that there aren't women working in a completely traditional structure. Many women do, most women probably do. And there are men that are working, you know, in, in, in a non-traditional structure. Right. But I think it's diversity is what we're looking for. And, you know. But we just have to recognize that we're trying to rewire people's brains. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty big task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, you and I totally enjoy that, but I understand why not everybody does. Right. This is one of Henry's questions. What are the qualities that make producers and audiences feel comfortable with a play? <laughs> and to what extent is discomfort a cherished aspect of either? Um, I, don't, I don't really need to see a play that doesn't and maybe where, this is where I am in my life right now, but I want to be taught something when I go to the theater. I want to have my eyes opened to something. I'm just really no longer interested in going out of the play and saying that was nice, mm -hmm. right? But is that just me? Do we find that audiences like that challenge? When you, are you seeing that? And, and do men and women want to challenge audiences in different ways? Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier when we came in about a Juliet Bear play that you saw 25 years ago, and she's a good friend, and and, um, and I think of, like when I described Cherie's play with directed by Irene Fournesse, uh, or I mean, I could say like the first time I heard Sun Ra, you know, when I was 19 years old, I was angry. I was like, how dare he, you know, how dare he mess up music like this. <laughs> But I think those are the moments, aren't they? Those right. are the moments that stick with us. Those visual moments, those emotional moments, those surprising moments that ang where we get upset because we don't quite get it. Right. But it stay it stays with us for years. To me, that's what it's about. You know, getting shaken out of our out of our complacency by something that's you know incredibly beautiful or profound or disturbing. There's nothing wrong with disturbing. Do you think women playwrights? And men playwrights do that differently? I have to say, for me, the times that it happens, they're, pro they're both like transcending their gender. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's what I would say that it's probably the same place and they're probably neither male or female. It's just for me. Mm -hmm. I just saw. Um, the first of uh, one of National New Play Network's Rolling World premieres, a new play by uh, Steve Yockey called Pluto. And it's um, a 90 minute play, but it takes place in the three minutes between the time a mother first learns of a school shooting and the time she realizes that it's her son who's the shooter and he's dead. Um, and it is so unbelievably powerful and disturbing and funny and Gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful, and absolutely horrifying, all in a single play. And Steve has written that mother 
as clearly as I understand my own self. Mm -hmm. So one of Henry's questions is, do men and women, you know, how do you find the voice? How does a, a male playwright take a feminine voice and a, a female playwright take a male voice? <coughs> Should we be doing more of that? Does that matter? What I would tell uh, playwrights to do, or suggest that they do, um, is actually go ahead and write the character as a man, and when you've finished it, just go back and change it to a woman. Right? Because unless the play is about, I mean, in this case it's a mother, but unless the play is about giving birth, or, you know, some, or, uh, I can't imagine a whole play about a woman having her period, but do you know what I mean? There's not, there's not a lot of things that actually require characters to be women or, or men. men. You know, there's not a lot of plays out there about prostate cancer. It's like, um, so, but what you find when you do this kind of uh, gender flipping thing is, you know, you, people are used to writing the male characters as subjects who have this depth and who have this action and these things they're trying to achieve. Um, if they're writing a female character, again, we're subliminally informed by the sexism that pervades our culture and we tend to write them a little more passive. So go ahead and write it as a man if that's your first instinct, and finish it. That's the thing, is finish the whole play. Because once you decide it's gonna be a woman, then you're writing it as a woman, right? Uh, so write it as a man, then go back and go, now which of these characters could actually be women? Then they'll be fully developed. I, I, to me, that, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> I mean, just because, the, the, for me, my characters are, are who they are. I mean, and then they're mostly women, and you know, there are men or there are jellyfish, uh, but <laughs> you know, they are they are who they are, and their gender is very intrinsic in, in in every action they take, in every decision they make, in every line they say. I guess I was thinking about advice to people who are wanting to start to write more female characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh uh, better writing. Female. So, so as an ex, sort of more of an exercise, or if somebody's challenging themselves to get to that level. It, I mean, it would, be, it would be an interesting exercise for me to like, yeah. to, to make the men see how that works. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, right, exactly. And yeah, the, like, yeah. Because then yeah. what you also start to realize is that all these ideas we have about gender are not really linked to biology, right? It's not, sex is our biology, gender is our behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of women who can act with a masculine gender, and there's plenty of men who can act with a feminine gender. But we're, we, you know, we have all these things lined up in our head. You're male, then you're masculine. You're uh, female, then you're feminine. You're, you know, if you're gay, you're one. If you're, uh, if you're heterosexual, you're another. Whereas these things are actually really fluid. So, but we have to, I feel like a lot of people have to kind of trick their brains into doing that, into, into thinking of their characters that way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Writers. Writers. Yeah. Writers. Yeah. Writers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you look at, for example, the whole Alien movie series, Ripley, the character, was originally intended to be a man. Right. Right? But you can only really look at the first film that way, because from that point on, she's obviously a woman. And in fact, they do add a child in the second one, and they add a boyfriend in the third one, and, <coughs> and, and, and then the, the whole fourth one is kind of about her having been reborn and, and, and reproduced. Which is why I say, write, you know, write the whole play. Hmm. <laughs> Playwrights. But either, even if you don't, even if you're not going to take, take that advice and write the whole play that way, the essential question to ask when you start writing is, is there any reason this character has to be a man? I think that's a, I think that's is there a any problem. reason this character has to be a man? And again, uh, you know, if it's not really about dicks or prostates, <laughs> then... <laughs> you went there. I was going to go there. <laughs> Show my thunder. I was trying to decide whether to say penis or dick, but I thought... <laughs> Taking the masculine yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Want to open it up to you guys. Anybody have a question you want to hear our thoughts on? Anybody? Are there questions from uh, the HowlRound folks or anything? Or should we keep going with the... Uh, yes? Uh, from Angie Morgan, has any research been done about how audience demographics affect programming diversity and vice versa? I don't know of any and I couldn't find any. I, and I'm hoping that somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong. Anybody know of anything? If, if not, I think we should be doing it. I think it's important and I think 
that we may find that some of these, you know, well-held thoughts about how it works are not true. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> right? Somebody, somebody in the back have a question? Well, I, um, it, it just feels like there is a big dinosaur dying <laughs> in every field all over. And, and it's making big loud noises mm -hmm. and you know, thrashing and whatever, but it's dying. Uh, my, my question has to do more with are we, our audience is motiv motivated. See, in my mind, disturbing the peace is what our, it's what it ought to do. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering how much we're motivated by just safety. I mean, when you say that you want to be disturbed, I, I think a lot of audiences come to feel safe and uh, reassured. Current, yeah. and, uh, and they're dying. <laughs> Those people, maybe. But, but I think the idea of, of safety in art is a dangerous coupling. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how much the feminine and masculine have to do with this, but I just think that overall thing of, no, don't disturb me, is, um, is unhealthy and needs to be addressed by men and women. But, and, and I believe we, you know, we, we, can't, we can't just say, to big regional theaters, which, by the way, at the taper, there was a play called The First Picture Show about that woman mm. oh. 10 years ago. I was just thinking And you were dissing her. the taper earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I... All right, right. I'm joking. <laughs> and really about the husband, not her. <laughs> I think we can't just dismiss the audiences. I think what we have to do is keep trying to pull them in and Bring disturb them, them and say, look, you didn't die. <laughs> right. All you did was think and ask yourself new questions. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's okay. And so I don't know. Older, I'm not sure what my question We've kind of been trashing older white audiences. And I just realized, <laughs> I didn't think about San Francisco and the Eureka Theater, for example, and, and at the Magic, I think, as well, and probably at ACT, that there was this hardcore group of you know, elder white theater goers who were the most adventurous right. and supportive and interesting. And I feel like I'm just sitting here trashing them for an hour. But I do feel like that, you know, I mean, it, I guess it's all about, it's all about nuance because they were, they didn't want to be coddled at all. Right. Well, that's how we got off Broadway, the uh, whole off Broadway movement, right? Those, mm -hmm. those, for us in South Florida, those people who went off Broadway in New York are who supported the theater that I ran, and they, we did talk backs three times a week, and they never said, how do you learn your lines? They were like, okay, <laughs> in that moment where you came through the door, what do you think the playwright, you know? So, um, yes, and, and of course, I am rapidly becoming an older white audience. <laughs> so uh, I think, I hope it is changing, and I hope we will continue to do that. And I see things that are disturbing to my concept of what theater is, even, not just that play or my own thoughts, but you know, you go see, you know, an Adam Rapp play and you're like, wow, really? <laughs> and yes, really, it is, because you just saw it, you know? So hopefully we can keep turning that out. Well, I think there are two factors that influence all of this. One is capitalism, so the need to make money, right. and the fact that our theaters are not subsidized. So in Europe, in Russia, there's a lot of theater that's making people uncomfortable. And it's fine if they walk out in the middle or don't come back because they have some support from the government. And their audience is a little more used to that kind of thing and, and eager for that thing. The second thing I think affecting American theater is geography. So the audience in San Francisco is going to be really different than the audience in Minneapolis. Right? Or it, and especially once you get into smaller and smaller towns in the Midwest and the South. So we try to talk about American theater and what will sell, um, but the fact is that people who live in more cosmopolitan communities um, with more people who look different from they do and act different from they do are going to be more open to seeing plays about those people mm -hmm. than I think in, in some other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But I hope we're changing that too. I, yeah. I, I mean, I hope we're... Well, certainly with National New Play Network, it's been a big part of our mission is to take that 
writer from Philadelphia and make sure that their work gets heard in Iowa City because the stories are about humans and, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be frightened to show somebody something different than what they know, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's that challenge. We shouldn't be frightened to, but we should recognize that their imaginations are not trained to see, though, to see people who look different from them as universal. Right, so women as an audience, as audience members, we're trained to identify with the men. We're trained to go, oh, I see myself in that protagonist. Um, and people of color are trained to see themselves in white people, because that's what we usually get. But how do we train them if we don't, if we're not putting it in front of them? That's the thing. We're talking about rewiring people's brains. It's big I stuff. Think, I mean, some of the fresh young playwrights that are working of color, I would say, I would add of color. Uh, in American theater today, to me, are so exciting. Language, right. structure, content, and they're they're of you know, uh, you know, this generation in terms of technology and understanding, and they're trained and they're ready and they're ambitious. And I so I have a lot of faith in, mm -hmm. in what's in what if there was the open door, you know. Right, there and they're the, often writing gender and racially neutral plays, mm -hmm. right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, um, his name is escaping me. The guy wrote appropriate. You know, there's there are no black actors on the stage. He's an African American writer, and people, uh, you know, they just did it really. And people are shocked, <laughs> shocked mm -hmm. when they find out <laughs> that he wrote the play. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm glad they're shocked. I'm glad they're being made to think mm -hmm. about it. But you know, you don't, you don't, you can. You are allowed to write men and women, and women of color, right? Thank you. Thank you. Right? So why should we be shocked or startled by the fact that an African American male is writing about white women? You know, it's a different voice and a different head. And so, yes, you have a question there. Yeah, I wonder about the sense of safety and security among the artistic directors, especially when you talk about women not wanting to do plays by women. Because I, to me, I'm comparing it to what was going on and probably still in the publishing industry where editors believed if a male editor bought a challenging book that lost money, he was considered a visionary, a woman would lose her job. Mm. And I wonder if you feel artistic directors are in that same position, that women don't have the luxury of taking chances because their job is always on the line. I think that's so real. Literary managers, artistic directors, Criticizing your own theater can lose you your job. For yes. one. I mean, I, I'm sitting here without those worries right now in my life, so I can speak very boldly. But I'm sure there are a lot of women within the power structure that don't feel free to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's that about? We're supposed to be in the world of, of you know, the alternative world of art and culture, <laughs> where people are intimidated to not stand up. Yeah, and the, and like you know that the fact that 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 Jackie Robinson rule of 18 percent of the women on Broadway. The women on Broadway would have 18 percent higher box offices, even though they're only one in eight. It means that somebody was saying that the bar is, has to be so much higher for women. Well, I think the stat of artistic directors right now is is people who can make a living as artistic directors is 20 20 percent women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say it's got to be. Yeah, you know, and it has it's like hasn't changed in 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So again, are we not, I'll go back to where we started. This is a five now, uh -huh. right? It's a five. Uh, I'll go back to where we started, which is, are we not opening that door and training those women to be artistic directors? Do they, because they don't have enough role models, are they not saying that uh, I'll go be a literary manager because that's a girl job? <laughs> you know, is that instead of being, I'll be an artistic director because I want to run a work B company? or I want to run my own company that does only women writers and casts only, you know. But, but that's a niche theater. Why does that need to be a niche theater? Why can't that, that be? Well, that goes to the whole sort of, oh, you write women's plays. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, automatically. It's like, oh, all right, so you'll have seven, seven, you know, women singing on a Sunday matinee, and that's it. Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of this also, the responsibility lies with the directors. Um, so, even though if you hire me to direct a show with you, I do want to get, hopefully get asked to come back the next season, there's a little bit of pressure there. I can really be the person, though, who can be like, you know what, this character was written as white, but what if we cast a Latino person? You know, what if we flip this from a man to a woman? Obviously trying to serve the play and working with the playwright on that. 
Um, but we have a little bit more room to take risks, I think, than artistic directors do. It's not ultimately going to be our fault if the yeah. play doesn't sell. Well, I think, too, as artistic directors, it's sort of the formula that, that it, 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 I mean, it does need to change. So you figure, okay, there are only a certain number of new unknown playwright slots, right? You're going to do known playwrights that you know you're going to see, you maybe work with, or you know this is going to thing. So if there's one unknown playwright slot, is there something that can shift that, and you have it between a man and a woman, is there something that can shift that artistic directors can say, you know what, I have a responsibility to put a woman in there? I don't know. As opposed to the responsibility of the better play? No, 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 no. As a responsibility, mm -hmm. is, I, I don't know, but is there, is there sort of a, a, a responsibility to, to, to gender parity? You know, if, if we've got two plays that these would each work, it does it weigh, well, this is by a woman and we have a responsibility, or this is by a writer of color and we have a responsibility. I want to uh, go to Henry's original question <laughs> just very quickly before we close, and, and maybe we're just going to leave this with you to think about. What are the dramaturgical assumptions and hidden biases that make us choose to produce far more plays uh, by um, each year by men rather than women. Would you read that again? Yeah. <laughs> and, and better this time? <laughs> uh, sorry, I got, I got confused by the difference between an M and an N. In <laughs> what are the dramaturgical assumptions and hidden biases that make us choose to produce far more plays by men than by women year after year? And I think the bigger question is, how do we change them? Yes. yes. Well, there's one little detail that you're talking about, women buying the tickets. But so often they're buying tickets to please their husband because they want to drive him to the theater and they know he's going to fall asleep and so they want a Clint Eastwood kind of thing. Do you know, so I think that's really a strong element in everybody's thinking. It's, it's not like they are free agents in this. So, well, that's that's a problem as old as time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, and look, but we're not all heterosexual. I mean, as a, as a feminist and a lesbian, I feel like the the thing that troubles me is that I I somehow don't I don't match up with the inequality that I see in the world mm -hmm. about us. Yeah. I kind of don't buy it. I never have. I've been, you know, done women's work and men's work. I. It made every job I've ever had, and the only one straight job I ever had was to be a firefighter. So, uh -huh. you know, I just kind of am always shocked. I think it's the same for people of color, when you're so shocked by the other's interpretation of you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't buy it, don't get it. So, I, it's always hard for me, especially when I was raised with four brothers, I always felt like I saw things that they never saw. They just didn't see it. It wasn't in their line of vision because of the perception ability or because of language or subtext or whatever that they didn't read as well as I felt like I did. Right. So if anything, I feel superior. <laughs> so, uh, so it surprises me. So I do think we have to count. I, I really think we have to count. And I think we have to speak with our, with our ticket sales. And, and I think people have to be, start being accountable like they do in every part of the society to be multicultural and to be fair. You know, and if they're not, I don't think we should give them our money. That's, that's how I feel. And I think it should be, a, it, it, like I said in the beginning, power concedes with nothing without a demand. It should be a demand. A demand. It's just nice stuff. It just hasn't worked 50 years here. Right. I mean. And I think we have, to, I, my take on this, and I, this hasn't changed since we started, is I think we have to educate more women to be the good storytellers. To, and be bold, and to be bold in their own and, way, and, 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 and to and to be to not be frightened of it. To say, we have to, Henry's making us say time out. I think we could <laughs> done. I think Thank we you. could continue this. Oh, right. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. That was great. Yeah, really interesting. Is that what you wanted, my friend?